Hi, welcome to Overlanding from Home. My name is Anton. I'm an avid overlander, lover of nature, and humanitarian by heart. The past while, I've always been interested in the outdoors, and I want to hear about other people's experiences and their rigs. Yes, the big rigs, the small rigs, everything they've done to design them and how they plan it. I hope you enjoy listening. Let's find out who today's guest is. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Overland followers during the lockdown. And uh, I trust you are well, and your countries are starting to relax, and you're being mindful. I think is the word about uh, getting out there with your masks and keeping your hands clean. And um, uh, today, I found a, a wonderful guy. Um, he is a very different chat to what I normally do. Um, a avid overlander, but he has two wheels and not four. And uh, I want to I want to happily introduce a chap by uh, the name of Pavel Kunz, and uh, his his handle on Instagram is far and farther, or further I should say. And uh, um, I, I'm very pleased to chat with you. It's going to be a completely epic chat because looking at your channels, it's going to be amazing dude and i'm sure there's going to be a lot to, to chat about so so thanks very much for signing in uh, pavel thank you very much for having me actually that was uh really nice yeah it's a, it's I, i'm i'm pretty sure you were as uh, surprised as i was i mean i i i love uh, i actually follow um the hashtag overlanding and yes. it, it, it brings up everything you know there's some really weird ones um, there was a, there was a, a black lady showing her her uh, reading glasses, and I completely didn't understand where where overlanding came up from from reading glasses. But anyway, um, you were there, and I went onto your channels, and it was pretty pretty gnarly. Um, it looks like you've done a fair amount the UK uh, to India and back. Uh, obviously, 2020, you're in uh, you're in Africa, and right now you are stuck in not a bad place, being Morocco. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I got stuck in Morocco for now about three months. But to be honest, there's not much to complain about being stuck in Morocco. I mean, people have been I stuck in. I definitely wouldn't complain. That's yeah, for sure. yeah. I mean, people have been stuck in much worse places, and uh, I think we now have this kind of uh, with some friends. Peru, we have this uh, competition, uh, which lockdown is going to be the longest in the world, whether it's going to be Moroccan one or a Peruvian. <laughs> really? Wow. Wow. That, that's going to be a pretty gnarly one because, you know, I think it's, it's personally, and, and this isn't what the chat's about, but it's really boiling down to a political thing at the moment. So, you know, it depends on which government's going to hold out the longest before uh, the public start rioting and causing trouble. Yeah, I think so. It's uh, especially in Morocco, for example, I think that uh, they kind of follow a suit and kind of, you know, that there's not the amount of much of testing and all that. So I think that it's uh, yes. a lot of uh, instead of actually some kind of a health um, control, really. But luckily, we are in a lockdown ease um phase so um you know uh from uh two days ago we can actually go out we can the shops are open and all that you stay within the same province um which yes. uh, which is completely fine before that you had to be lo confined at home but now it's just you can you can travel i'm quite uh looking forward to explore some of the mountains just behind the house Wonderful. and all that yeah yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So, so listen, I'm, I've got a lot that I want to ask you because your your scenarios are completely different to what what I would normally experience. You have a lot. You have to be a lot more mindful about what you're doing, um, in the sense of everything. I mean, it's food, water, fuel, <laughs> spare parts, um, uh, everything. And I, I just want to honor you. Uh, and and I'm going to be very honest here. I want to honor you because. Um, many people, when they go outdoors and overland, they want to be seen as uh, big and proper, and 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 um, and they 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 keep a a chip on their shoulder, and they don't have the humility that you have that you share with your followers. And what that means is that if you fall off your bike, yeah, you don't have an ego 
to take a photo and you don't hide it from anybody, you know? <laughs> and I think that is, that is amazing, dude, because many people, they're like, no, don't take any photos. I don't want anyone to know that I fell or like I ripped a tire off and I, you know, I turned my vehicle upside down. You obviously don't have that problem, which I think is fantastic. No, I, I totally don't have that problem. I think it boils, uh, one part of that is that, you know, without showing people that, um, this happens almost, it can happen every day, you know. Now I'm training here some enduro skills and I drop the bike every day and there's no reason why people shouldn't see that, that that happens. You know, I got stuck on a log in um, in Montenegro and I posted it on Instagram. You know, these things are happening uh, and you have to be ready for it because it's not all just super cool traveling and super photos and super landscapes. There's a lot of trouble and I would call it call shit on the road, which can happen and go yeah. wrong. And I think that uh, Instagram, unfortunately, and social media are pushing this perfect, picture perfect ADV life, you know. And I think uh, yeah. there's a huge part of travel which uh, is down to the real life and obstacles and, you know, being, you know, um, stuck on a toilet for a week because you have, you have food poisoning and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I think try to do a little bit more real, um, real world kind of picture. So people know what's, yes. what's waiting for them on the road. Here. <laughs> no, listen, I completely agree. Ego is very, very dangerous. And, uh, it's something that I, I learned at a very young age, um, at a very young age is to, is to is to not have it try not to have an ego but hum, humility i think is 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 another big word that should be used more more often you know and uh um i just wanted to let you know i think that's fantastic you've done really well with it and there's going to be a few other points that i'm i'm going to touch up on but um just one one thing quickly how did you choose the bike that you did because it's clearly bigger than you are and you <laughs> you are doing uh you know uh, uh um back squats in order to lift it off the ground so you can climb back on again i mean what what made you choose this this and it's amazing i flip and love it i mean if my wife or my mom when i was younger said listen uh, many years ago my mother said you will never get a bike until you leave the house you know because yeah i was just one of those one of those crazy kids so i've never really been been into it but i'm completely in awe of your bike i think it looks fantastic you've <laughs> thank obviously you been very <laughs> mindful in what you've done and what you carry. How did you decide on this bike that made it the one that, that is going to work for you and, and where you're going? So that's a really good question because this is my second bike. I'm not like this um, motorcycling veteran as uh, some of those uh, people are. Um, so I'm riding motorcycles only since 2013. And uh, this is second before it was Honda CB500X, which is the similar weight. Uh, so we are talking about 200 kilo bike. And on that Honda, I went to India and back. That was the first trip. And um, that kind of, only by doing that trip, I figured out what I actually need from the motorcycle and what are the limits of that Honda. So Honda, for example, had 47 horsepower. And now I have Yamaha 700, uh, Tenere 700, which has 70 horsepower, right? and Okay. Without actually riding that Honda for 54, well, I, I did 100,000 kilometers on the Honda, 54,000, right? So I know exactly where the limits of that Honda like are. And based on yeah, that yeah. experience and based on what I didn't like or where the limit was, for example, on the sand, that Honda was almost impossible to ride with the luggage, right? So I was now looking yes. for the bike which would be similar weight or lighter, a little bit more powerful, but it would be as simple as Honda. There's almost no electronics on these bikes, both on the Honda and Tenere, right? So I, okay. I chose this, um, this Yamaha because it is really upgraded CB. And it's the bike which is very simple uh, by these today's measures. It has two cylinders and it doesn't have a huge amount of power. And it's water cooled, which means that it's really reliable engine and it's really simple yeah. to fix. There's there's only ABS on that bike. There's no bells and whistles, anything. And it has same weight. And I'm because I rode hundred thousand kilometers with 
with the 200 kilos, I'm really used to uh, that amount of weight. You know, and I lived in London for 13 years before I left uh, on that trip. And you just cannot, you know, I didn't have a garage there. And the only insurance for a dirt bike where I could learn would be so expensive that it was prohibitively like impossible to buy a second bike because it's, it's, it's just so expensive. So I was stuck with these bigger bikes and that's really my, my whole career is on a bigger bikes. So, um, yeah, I have a, just experience and, and, um, feel for the big bikes. You know, I have a friend here in Morocco and she rides, uh, DRZ 400, which is 40 or 50 kilo lighter bike. And I don't feel yes. that um, confident or safe on the lighter bike because it jumps over all the, all the time. If you go off-road on the lighter okay. bikes, they are uh, much more, you are able to control them much more easily with your weight. But also the bike, yes. if you go over the stones, the bike, the lighter bike just jumps all over the place and you have to balance it out with the heavier bike like mine. I just keep the balance and just plow through it just gas constant throttle yes. and that's it you know so that's the that's very yes, cool that's the reason why i have a bigger bike and also i try um i tend to do some miles so i usually don't have much of a planning and i <laughs> kind of get stuck somewhere uh meaning that i exploring or i go off road here and there you know yes. and i stay and then suddenly yeah. I kind of like, oh, yeah, maybe I have only two weeks on a visa. So I need to grow, go to the border quickly. So I'm able, I want the bike I can do off-road on. And I can also do 1,000 kilometers a day. And that's what the Tenere is allowing me to do. Because, you know, it's, it's a bigger bike. It's stable on a highway. It's good. It's comfortable. So I, I, have, I have good things from both of the world, off-road and and kind of road performance yeah it makes it very it, it does make i think your your logistics quite challenging i mean i do a uh, humanitarian work so for me i plan distance with mileage mm -hmm. uh, oh sorry i mean a, a distance with fuel. Yeah. um food i can carry food uh, I can carry water, I can carry fuel, I can carry a bunch of clothes. I mean, for you, it's a completely different ball game. Yeah, um, yeah. You need to worry about all of that. Now, looking on your bike, I see you've got, I think it looks like a 10, a little 10 liter canister oh, no, no. that you carry on your... It's not 10, it's... What do you care? Is it 5 liters? It's 4.8, yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> I mean, that, that makes it very challenging. So so with your, with your existing tank, yep. And your um, your little auxiliary tank, whatever you want to call yep. it. Um, what? How far can you go? What's the distance? So on the Tenere, I have a range of four hundred kilometers to a dry tank. And the, that's and not the bad. Rotopax. That's not too bad. Yeah. So I, the, it's a sixteen liter tank, and another four, well, five liters if you overfill it, right? So we have twenty one yes. liters, and I can do about four hundred. If I do very, very gentle ride, even off-road, I can stretch it to about 430. Yeah. That's, but you don't want to chance it. You always want to keep something <laughs> yeah, yeah. in case. I have you know, also a uh, stove. So I cook. When I, cook, when I camp, I cook. I, 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 sufficient. So even if I break down or even if I get stuck somewhere where nobody is, which is really hard to find yes. a place in the world where nobody would go for a day, to be honest. I, that never happened to me in yes. the desert, anywhere. I always met people on each day. So I have a stove, I have water. So I also have like the total emergency is my, my petrol stove. That's one liter, one liter bottle for the petrol stove, which takes me about 20 kilometers. So, yeah. That's the last resort. Okay. <laughs> and all right. So then, so then, obviously, cooking, right? So you you would have a little camping stove with a little canister, like you said, and yeah, um, uh, a knife and a fork, uh, probably a very small basic plate. Um, what what can you? Um, so so, do you plan to go from A to stay at a chalet or a B and B or something at B, or do you literally have a little tent that you bomb on somewhere and and uh, or do you sleep out in the ocean? I mean, up, up, out in, in the open. 
Uh, how do you how do you normally plan it? Because to me, I mean, this is a whole different. Yeah, so I think that's a difference between having a rig, uh, overlanding rig, and having a, a motorbike. Because I'm really tiny, right? So I can actually hide almost anywhere. The only problem is, for example, cities. Then you have a little bit of advantage because you are carrying. I don't know if you have a tent on your rig, but um, you usually people kind of sleep in the cars or <clears throat> the rigs. Yes. For me, that's more difficult. So I tend to go um through the mountains so like let, let's say there are two different modes on a motorcycle so if you go and like my first part to india um what i did is um that was with my ex-girlfriend and we kind of went in and we had a direction and then in each city we kind of looked for the accommodation and we parked the bike she parked the car and and that was it right yeah. and you go from we didn't book in advance we just arrived somewhere and that was kind of what we have been doing. On the way back, though, I was camping for almost four months uh, through, through Central Asia, Iran, and, and back. And th that is a little bit different mode because I just rock up somewhere when I like. Um, I During the day, I buy supplies from the locals, and then I camp, yeah. and that's it. You know, because I don't have that much range, I cannot... I carry maximum six liters of water, usually two, lit uh, two or four liters of water, yeah. really. Um, and very little food, yeah. usually foods to maximum like two, three meals because I don't have a space, right? So I really rely on locals and I just go through villages, buy stuff, and then go somewhere to find a campsite and, and do it that way. Um, yeah. That's pretty okay. That's I mean that's that's pretty pretty decent. I think uh, I'm not saying safety is a big concern, but it, you have to be mindful of mm. it too. So um, also food, like you said, there is there's nothing worse than being caught with food poisoning. I've um, I'm I'm a very big fan of 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 eating off the side yep. of the road. So those little kiosks on the side of the roads, I will I will go and eat no problem, and and I've never ever been sick. I was in Egypt mm. flying to Ghana and I ate in a restaurant and I had yeah. food poisoning. They had to take me to the clinic when I arrived yeah. in Ghana. Um, and they taught me a lesson. Don't eat in restaurants. <laughs> you know, just if you eat on the side of the road, you can see what you, uh, what you're eating. If you think it needs to be cooked more, they can put it back yeah. on the fire. Yeah. Um, you know, to me, that's a, that's a very big deal. So, um, I'm hundred percent agree with that. I mean, I met, uh, so because I have a friend and she's a pharmacist, um, I had really good medication with me, um, on a, on a trip. And what happened was yes. that I literally was dealing drugs throughout Central Asia to the foreigners and to the, to the tourists because they, they didn't Beautiful. have correct medication. They didn't know what to take. And, you know, everybody was just snacking Imodiums like M&Ms. And that is the worst thing you can actually yeah. do for yourself. Um, <laughs> by the way, um, I do have a lecture on that. When I was on uh, speaking on Horizons Unlimited, I, I actually did a talk about how not to get, um, you know, uh, food poisoning and how to treat it. Um, so, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's on a website. There's a, there's a PDF presentation on the website. So it's with all the, with the different drugs and all that, how to use them and what was to use them for, what not to use them for. Because people don't know. And people think that, you know, sometimes, like, for example, in Africa, there is a different branding for a drug which treats the diarrhea then it's in Europe. And yes. people think that the brand name is what they're looking for and they cannot find it in Africa. Correct. But actually, if you look at the substance the, which actually is inside that drug, you know, you can see that in Egypt, it's called Antinal and uh, in, in Europe, it's uh, called Ensephoril. And then once you kind of match these together, you know that you're not getting something special local, but you can bring it from Europe, you know? Why not? That's that's very very interesting. Hey? I, I well, obviously I know that's right, but I don't think, and I'm pretty accurate that not many people will go into that much detail to try and figure out the right, you know, mm. the right product. And 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 every pharmacy has a lot of different things. I mean, I can go into a pharmacy, obviously in Cape Town where I live, and um, it's yep. complete, yep. you know. But that's because it's a city. I can go to a pharmacy in a little town called mm. Nuki, which is about three and a half hours outside of Nairobi and I would have one eighth of the options that I normally would out yeah. of Cape Town. Yeah. So, 
you know, uh, it, it, it creates a whole nother big problem. There's certain countries you will go into, like Zimbabwe, they they get quite sticky if you carry mm. too much of the mm. same thing. I mean, if you have two two boxes of medication, you know, someone I don't know why they're crazy. They you know they might think that you're trying to you know uh, flog it off to make <laughs> money. So I, I've actually I've actually seen them. I've had people come back to me and tell me that, um, and these guys have big rigs and they have something like. Um, they were carrying something like 120 liters of fuel just yeah. for themselves, and and they had to leave the fuel at the border um, for the day because they thought they were going to go and sell it in uh, um, in yeah. Zimbabwe. So I, you know, I, it's just crazy stuff, and it just makes it, you know you just have to be very mindful about what what you're trying to organize and do because people don't. Yeah, think I mean, it, to be honest, if you brought up the borders. So I can see that people with rigs, cars, uh, have much more rigorous checks and prob- more problems on borders than motorcyclists. Like, if you ask me what was the worst border crossing in all my travels, it was actually Bulgarian-Turkish one. You know, we spent, yeah. Really? We spent there like five hours, they checked, and they didn't understand that we are going to Pakistan and Iran, not from it. But then all the countries which on the internet, you kind of read how terrible it was, like Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, Iran and Pakistan on the border. As a motorcyclist, yeah. nobody cares about you. Like, I haven't been searched in terms of my luggage in any country so, so far. Yeah, they probably think you've got nowhere to hide it. Yeah. So obviously, with a vehicle like mine, they'd have a... They'd, they'd have a and also, fight. you... you because I can carry so little, it would be like, you know, you cannot, even if you're a smuggler, you will not be able to smuggle any reasonable amount of anything into the country on a motorcycle, <laughs> especially, you know, That's so true. no, we, I had really a uh, good experience uh, with border crossings. You know, we, I didn't have a problem with medications or something like that. You know, I was basically, I have a first yes. aid kit packed with the, with stuff and I just say, yeah, this is the first aid. And they kind of go, just, yeah, wave me through usually. Yeah. Yeah. Move on. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, uh, that's, it's, it's a very interesting chat. And I, I you know, I have a full medic bag mm. and, um, I, I, I obviously carry that if I do get into a little village and, uh, some of the kids need help. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm there to help them with reading yep. glasses. So, um, if I if, if if there's a kid that needs help with a wound or a cut or a, a you know something else, I'm I'm able to help mm, them with mm. it. Um, but then also anyone on my crew that comes with me, if they do get uh, food poisoning, if something does go wrong, I'm I'm able to support them and give them that. You know, uh, malaria yeah. uh, malaria test kits and things like that for me are a big deal. You know, up north, I don't. Uh, up, up north, meaning yep. Africa, um, I don't know if malaria is a big deal in in Morocco, for example. I haven't really researched it. I haven't been. No, I don't so think so. It would to be, be honest, um, haven't. Oh, well, at least I'm not taking any anti-malaria stuff. And I'm still fine. So I'm, I'm here almost five months. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, has there has there been any direction on the from the from the country about uh, chilling up on the um, on the restrictions? You know, the, the state of emergency is now pushed uh, to tenth of July, and uh, that means that um, they have to decide what they want to do after that. And I think that this is the ease out phase. So I hope that in July they will be able to open the border, but until 10th mm. of July, there's nothing. And, you know, um, I mean, here where I am, I'm on a little seaside town called, uh, Tamrak. you know, it was very relaxed in terms of restrictions. Um, so I, I have yeah. nothing yeah. to complain about, to be honest. Uh, it was really nice to stay here. Locals are really nice. You know, there were some reports i'm not sure maybe you can fill me in on that one um there were some reports that in africa foreigners were kind of seen as um distributing the corona or spreading the corona so there was a little bit of like antagonism against the the foreigners um i'm not sure what if that's yeah. actually true or not but in here in morocco there's nothing like that people Attitude to, towards us as foreigners didn't change at all in here, at all. Yeah. So just to give you a, a like a one minute, there was a big 
misunderstanding by uh, certain township areas, and unfortunately it was in the black areas uh, within Africa that they believed that this was a white man's virus and the blacks couldn't get it because the white men brought it mm. from overseas. Um, and it caused, it didn't cause a lot of trouble. It was a misunderstanding. Then they realized, okay, hang on a minute. But, you know, the, the bigger problem outside of that, uh, which is education, yeah. the biggest problem is a lot of these countries within Africa, as we all know, live hand to mouth. And yeah. that's, that's caused more trouble Indeed. because um, they need to be out in the streets in order to make money to live yeah. for that night. Um, and they, if they can't do that, they can't eat. If they can't eat, it causes obviously unrest and then crime and then all sorts of, sto- and then all sorts of stuff comes up. So um, that, that was one of the things. It wasn't many countries. I know Kenya was one. I think DRC was the other. South Africa mm. was one. Um, I think that was about it. But, you know, um, it's hit different countries in Africa very differently. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. we, were, we were given restrictions for three mm. weeks, complete lockdown. You can only go to a pharmacy yep. or a hospital. You can go to buy food, no alcohol, mm. no cigarettes, um, no buying clothes, nothing like that. You can buy food um, and you can buy, go to the pharmacy and doctor. Yep. That was it. And we're on three months now, and it's now being declared unconstitutional yep. um, because we're on our third month. And uh, on our third month, and um, now we're on level three in South Africa, uh, and we're sitting on I think fifty thousand mm. people. I think actually I haven't even checked. I don't really look at it anymore because it's become political. There we go, fifty-two, so fifty-three thousand people, um, and twenty-nine thousand recovered. So more recovered than oh, confirmed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. make, which is great. Um, so there, it looks like there's a bit of a tipping point. Um, so it, it's it's definitely it, it's very interesting to see how um, you know how it's perceived in certain areas. And and I'm you know I'm I was supposed to do a, a humanitarian trip uh, the week yeah. of the lockdown. Okay. And uh, obviously, I couldn't do that. I, I put it on hold. So, um, is is so a plan to resume I'm, the I'm, operation? It will. It will happen. It's just been on. It's just been put on yeah. on hold. Um, and I'm hoping August, maybe September, to go to go ahead and do it. You know, for obviously for us, weather plays a very yep. big role. Um, it's heading into winter now. We've had three days of. Heavy winds and okay. heavy rains um, in the in the, in the Western Cape and in, in 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 Cape Town. So uh, we're going into winter. We're going to chill. Going into summer is normally like mm-hmm. November. Um, so September, October could be a nice time to go. Chilly in the evening, but nice weather during the day. You know, up uh, going up north into Botswana, okay, so we have to... beautiful okay. twenty twenty six degree mm. days. And then it's like you know single single digits uh, in in the. So uh, speaking about that, um, so um, obviously you're going to cross the borders to Botswana. Would that mean? Yes. Um, so you positive feeling about actually that Africa will kind of open and resume the border, cross border travel by let's say August, September, November, October ish. Um, so I say yes mm. and no. Um, th- although things are lightening up, the the a country, f- a, a, and here's a true example. So Botswana borders us. There's massive travel because people fly into yep. Johannesburg and then drive into Botswana, mm-hmm. for example. And there's a massive, uh, a massive drive because of tourism that has been affected heavily Indeed. by the lockdown. But the borders in Botswana, there's a handful of people with a virus compared to South Africa. So South Africa might say we will Mm -hmm. open the border, but Botswana might say, no, we're keeping the border closed because we don't want any virus coming over. Uh, You know, uh, just to give you an example, a live Mm -hmm. example Mm -hmm. right now, uh, let me just zoom in. Botswana is showing, oh, that's Zambia. Botswana is showing 48 people with the virus. 48? 48. South Africa is sitting on 58,000 or 50,000. 48 people or 48,000 people? 48. (laughs) Okay, that's a a, a staggering difference, isn't it? 
Exactly, exactly. So I think that's what's going to be the deciding mm. factor. You know, if if um, I think that's really what it's going to boil boil down to is 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 yeah. that. You know, um, and and I think this is where the the after coronavirus is going to come into mm. effect. So for you, um, uh, moving across border might be might I don't know. It, it might be depending on mode of transport. Being on a bike, they might say. Mm, doesn't matter mm. you know you you're not involved with anyone and and things like that so anyway i don't want to spend time on that there's still so much to, yeah yeah uh, cr- let's crack to, on i mean like we could to, we could probably talk yeah, about yeah, corona yeah, correct, for, a, correct. <laughs> for a long time isn't it uh, correct so um obviously you've chosen the tires that you have and they work very well uh do you have a tire of course kit? so um, I converted my motorcycle to tubeless because most of the off-road bikes are with tubes. So I converted it into tubeless. I have a little compressor and I have a tire patch kit. Uh, well, mushroom plugs. Um, I, I care. Yeah. Okay. And uh, as a lot of people in motorcycling community would say, punctures in the front are very rare and punctures in the rear is what you need to be worried about. Being me, I have now two punctures in the front and zero in the rear for just the trip in Morocco, to be honest. So, no, de- definitely. That's, okay. You know, these things are uh, the basic I never leave out with because <clears throat> you get the tire punk, you, do, you get the punctures, you get maybe broken cables on the bike, you get maybe, you know, bent things or... Um, you know, there's little damage or your battery dies. I have little capacitors so I can start the uh, bike with just the capacitor. I don't need the battery. And the, mm. this whole equipment is kind of designed to be that if I'm in the middle of nowhere, I can get out of there to the closest village. That's how I can design what I take with me. So definitely, yeah, tire puncture kit and pump and you know, it's funny because I usually use my spare fuel for locals and my air compressor for locals. Yeah, it's it's common like it. I mean, even with winches, everyone thinks, oh, you must carry a winch. Yeah, if you're doing solo, then yes, take a winch. But everyone yeah. that I've asked that, that has a winch, you know, like how how often do you use it? And I'm talking about South Africa or SADC mostly. SADC is the mm. southern region mm. of Africa. Um, in Australia, it's very different and things like that in, 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 in the US, you know. So for us, um, the guy says, no, I've had a winch for 12 years. I used it once for me just to see if it worked, <laughs> but I used it yeah. for another guy, you know. And, 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 and that's the common thing here. If I was to go on a solo trip by myself, completely, I would yeah. get a winch for sure with an extra rope to carry. But um, I'm quite surprised that you have space for a for a uh, a little com- compressor. That's, yeah, but, uh, you know the thing is that it's if you are in the middle of nowhere, and what I really like is to go very local. So I'm um, I'm trying to uh, to travel on a small villages. I usually don't go to big touristic places um, because I'm I, I try to to get the feel for the people, and I usually. I'm really lucky that, you know, there's one, there's something about traveling solo on a motorcycle that uh, for some reason you are a little bit more approachable to the other people, to the locals than if you are for in a group of motorcycles or even in a car. Like when we traveled to India, my, my girlfriend had a Jeep, Suzuki Grand Vitara 4x4. We bought it two months before we left and didn't change anything on that. Okay. And that was the first car which I bought, which obviously the clutch burned very quickly. Um, well, anyway, and the really interesting thing was that um, when I arrived somewhere as a motorcyclist alone, the people were really open. They were not scared. They were not, you know... Um, kind of thinking who who the hell is this you are kind of traveler right but if you rock up somewhere yeah. with a car because a lot of cultures have a car as a status of of as a symbol of a status or a wealth yeah. it kind of is a little bit different then so it was really interesting um that i really had the two experiences going with the car motorcycle and a car to india 
was one trip and going solo on a motorbike back was another trip. And it really changes the dynamics when you in, interact with the locals. It's really interesting, really interesting. Wow. I mean, that's uh, that's quite dynamic to have those, you know, because everything's different. Cultures are different. Food yeah. is different. And um, religion. Oh, yeah. uh, but no one sits and thinks about the difference between vehicles. <laughs> I know that there's a difference between brands. In, in South Africa, there's always a ripoff between a Ford, oh, really? a Toyota, a Land Rover. Really? And a, it's crazy. I'm actually so sick and tired of it. You know, everyone thinks that because I drive a Land Rover that my vehicle breaks down all the time. <laughs> I you mean, know? it's probably um, similar. Which, which yeah, is not yeah. true. I think it's probably similar in a, in a, a motorcycling community. So um, uh, <laughs> let's say 10 years ago, there was this program, Long Way Around, which was even McGregor or Charlie Borman. They basically... Yes, yeah, they took the BMWs that. around the world, right? And then yes. that started the yes. whole adventure motorcycling. And even like calling adventure motorcycling, it just doesn't make sense that some bikes are called adventure motorcycles and some are not, you know? It, it, you can have the same adventure on a 125cc Chinese bike as you have on a BMW, you know? It, it, it's yeah. about your yeah. mind and it's about what you do. It's not about the motorcycle. So I'm a little bit sick of the fact that you there is this there's this notion that you should have a BMW or a KTM and you need the gear, you need all that in order to yeah. go on a long distance trip. Like, you know, I did. Yeah, and that's, that's true. not true. That's, that's not true, true at all. And I love to follow people uh who do kind of crazy stuff you know there are people on mopeds and scooters going around the world and it's really wonderful to see them um just pedal along you know yeah no i completely agree so so tell me um your best or, or what do you use for navigation i mean obviously on your bike i see you've got this uh um you've got this quite a big uh, that, I don't know what to call it, like a big screen on it. Does, does that give you all the uh, um, bits and pieces on, on temperature and stuff like that on your bike as well as navigation? Do you use your phone for nav? I'm yeah, sure so, you do. I mean, uh, most people because do. obviously as light as possible and as cheap as possible in a sense. So I don't have a special yeah. GPS unit. Um, I only use my, my iPhone. Uh, as a as a main navigation and now well actually that's not true i bought a really cheap um android phone uh, which i have on a motorbike because if you have four iphone everybody thinks that you're rich especially on the border crossings uh so i y yeah really that, that was that was throughout central asia throughout central asia it was quite um uh, quite because uh, again i think that the apple is considered like a luxury brand so what, so what I wow. did is that I have iPhone in my pocket and for navigation, I'm using Android phone and I'm using application which is called Maps.me. Maps.me. Yeah. 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 Maps .me. Um, and yeah. that is main source of my navigation off road. Uh, when I go, um, I sometimes go where actually there is no roads. So what I do is on a satellite, I look um, on a Google satellite and plot my own route through the dirt roads if if there is no road yes and then i imported that to maps me so i i have a route to follow yeah okay okay that's that's pretty yeah, yeah. Easy. i mean that it, maps me is a perfect you know it's offline it runs on phones both android and iphone and it's wonderful application because <laughs> because the map data are not accurate which means that you get lost i mean that to me, it happens yeah. so many times that you maps me tells you there's a road. You arrive there, and there's no road. Or maps me says there's no road and there is a highway. You know, so it is I, I love to travel with it because it has this unpredictable kind of elements to it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I I don't uh, I don't trust maps personally. I mean, I, mm. I had a Garmin and uh, I don't I didn't trust it. I would always refer it, and I didn't trust um, Google Maps either. I use Google Maps a lot, but I I wouldn't I wouldn't like like now. In fact, what I've done, which you would may find interesting, is that I've taken and uh, I've got the new iPad yep. Mini, 
and I downloaded all the maps on it. Maps.me, iOS, mm. Lander, mm. Google Maps. Uh, there's tracks for Africa, which oh, might be interesting tracks for Africa. To you. I don't know that. Yeah, um, okay. That's a very, very big African tracks. It's not very big way up north where you are. There are some. It's more for down the southern area, central southern areas, Africa. But go on. I'll send you a link. You can have a look. They're, they're amazing. That would, um, be a, that would be really cool. And, yeah. And then what I did is I included uh, um, the Garmin InReach Mix. Yes. And that I, I linked that with an app on, on the iPad Mini because um, it, it doesn't mean I need to have two navigations. I just need one. And on it's a paid service, but you can text off the iPad. Um, you can do anything you want. It's fantastic. So it's just simple. It's easy. So that is my 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 system so, to use, and I think iPhones are great. You know, personally, better than 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 Garmin, for example. Is Garmin's quite limiting according yeah. to the device, whereas for an iPad, you can log anything you want on it and use it for emails and put a SIM card in it. Um, you know, so hold on. Um, so I have um, Garmin InReach Mini uh, as a as an emergency beacon and all that, and I paid the cheapest subscription, obviously. <laughs> Uh, so it's only yes. for the SOS, really. Um, but how do you use okay. it? You you have if you have a if you pay more, then you pair it with your iPad, and then what's the advantage of having it on the iPad paired with the iPad? It, it pings you, it gives you GPS coordinates uh, better than the iPad, the inReach or. So, so it works slightly differently. Uh, I, you can pay, I think there's three mm. options. I think the, there's one that you have, then you get like a middle one and then you get the, the so you can pay for yep. it month to month or you can pay for a yearly mm. subscription and, and, and it can give you tracking. So you can go in yep. and log tracking, but you can also share that on, uh, with the family yeah, and yeah, friends, yeah. you know, or yeah. on, on a website. Um, but then it also gives you weather mm, for where you mm. are. Um, you can use it to text people. So if there's no cell yep. phone signal, you can use the app to text yep. via satellite. So you, I mean, I paid for the one where I could only send 40 text mm. messages. But for me, being away for two weeks, yep. that's all I need is to go in the, in the bush, send my wife if she's not with me or my, or my family mm. and say, you know, I'm fine. I'm here. Got you late. Got you early. Um, no signal, you know, all that type of stuff. So the functionality with the app is okay. amazing um, compared to using the, um, uh, um, the the normal Garmin, you know, where you have to, well, on a normal Garmin, you can't mm. actually type. Um, there is no messaging yeah. service yeah. for it. So you can buy the expensive one, but for the cheaper one, it's yeah, super yeah, easy. Yeah. No, that's good. That's a good, good thing. Well, um, so... So what's next? Uh, let's have a look here. Um, what is the favorite mod on your on your bike at the moment? Ah, uh, well, I haven't modified it that much to be honest, um, because I like to keep it stock. Because then you can repair it anywhere in the world. Most often, if you have special yes. stuff on a, on a, on a bike, then it's terrible. Um, special favorite mod. To be honest, it's going to be the stronger spring on my rear suspension when I put it on because it's quite bouncy at the moment. It's a soft spring. Um, it's it's almost a okay. stock bike. I mean, I have added just very few tiny bits like heated grips, you know, so when you are up in the altitude, you don't, your, your hands not freeze. Um, some lights, uh, but other than that, it's a completely stock bike. Um, so I'm... Um, maybe the favorite mod would be the tubeless conversion because I wouldn't. Okay. So if you have tubes, you have to take the wheel off. You have to take the tire off. You have to patch the tire. Yes. The tube, then you have to yes. put it on, you know, it's a five day. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> you know, and with me, I'm in 10 minutes, I plug it with the mushroom and in 10 minutes off I go, you know, I carry the spare tube Love because you. if you cut the tire, then yeah. you would be done. But you know, for a punctures, that's probably the the best mod. Yeah. Okay. So I want to touch on two things before I ask you a last question. So, so this has actually come up before with a with a with a friend of mine that I did a well now a friend that I did a, another podcast with Ferenc. He's from uh, mm -hmm. Hungary. Uh, and and by the way, folks, if you're listening, I did mention it earlier. Um, 
Pavel is from uh, Czech Republic. So um, uh, rubbish, plastic and recycling is a massive issue. And I see you very focused on planting trees. Is is, yes. is that right? Is, yeah, is so that I have two projects. I have uh, Trees for Lure, which is planting trees on reforestation project in Albania. Um, that happened when I was coming back through National Park in Albania on my way back from India. Um, I I fell in love a little bit with the area and was kind of thinking how to get, how to give back to the communities uh, as from the like us travelers. So I started this and we would like to um, re- do actually reforestation from the National Park, really. Uh, and um, unfortunately, last year when we were about to start planting, there was an earthquake, 6.5 Richter scale. So it, it was wow. exactly the time when we were having a, a planting event. And this year in the spring, when we were going in and have everything planned, we already bought trees. Um, there was a coronavirus. So we are going to try yes. um, autumn. Uh, so that's one of the projects. And then uh, another is I Don't Trash My Travel, uh, which is on the website yes. as well. Yes. And that's the... Uh, kind of a responsible uh, way how to travel. It's, it focuses on, um, I would like to everybody to think about when they go shopping, when they do uh, restock piling, like what you buy and how packaging you use and all that, because obviously, the, as you said, the plastic and the trash is a huge issue almost in every single country we go. And um, Yes, it's about the fact that you know, even if you eat in a restaurant or even if you try, then the, if you generate the trash, it needs to go somewhere. And most of the countries has very limited infrastructure to deal with it, so it ends up in the landfill somewhere in a in a forest or in a river. So yes. it's it's a little bit of education on that one. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know, I think what you've done is 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 amazing. Is is you've actually given a breakdown of how many days, uh, wait, um, what it is. And, you know, because that really shows people exactly what it is. I mean, when, when, when we go into, into certain campsites uh, in Botswana and Namibia and South Africa, you have to take out what you take in for a vehicle that's Mm. doable. For you, it's a completely different ball game, but it can be easy because it's a mindset that people exactly. don't don't have. You know, taking taking a, a little a chocolate um, a chocolate wrapper, for example, and all your other little bits of plastic, and putting it into an empty um, um, a water bottle, yep. for example, you will be very surprised how much you can fit into the exactly. water bottle. You know, and the whole challenge about I don't trash my travel. I mean, I have to give the credit because the I don't trash my travel as a project actually started in India. And I met the guys and I'm in contact with guys. They started in India to, to fight the pollution in uh, India on the trails. So it is an Indian project, which is quite interesting. And what I did is I, I did this um, challenge to challenge myself on a motorbike to keep the trash for the duration when I'm in the country. And then you dispose it and when you're leaving the country, right? You don't, you don't need to carry it all around because it would be impossible for me for a year. But what it does yes. is that you obviously run out of space very quickly on a motorcycle. And then if you go shopping and somebody gives you a plastic bottle or a paper wrapper or a box, you're like, no, 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 I cannot do that. So you have to have, for example, your own packaging and start shopping and you need to con- communicate that you want to use your own packaging. And a lot of interesting things happen that way, even with the locals. I had a really good feedback from people. Oh, you don't want plastic. You have your packaging, you know. Let's just start to think about it, that you can actually do it. True. Listen, it's very possible. I mean, my 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 wife's a massive advocate for it. And 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 she she wanted to start a project that when you when you go into a into a grocery mm. store and you buy stuff, everything's in plastic or okay. polystyrene. And and uh, I, I you know to to take it from the shelf, pay for it. 
take it to your vehicle, unwrap it in your vehicle, put it mm -hmm. in your own stuff, you know, in your own little crate or your own boxes or whatever, and then give that that plastic and that polystyrene back to the store yeah. and say, thank you. I don't need this. It's yours. <laughs> Recycle it properly, you know. Obviously, most of the stores you have these big eyes going, oh, but we and I, you know, they start stuttering. And, but, you know, and to me, that's the way that it should be. You know, the guys, accountability for recycling is huge. And South Africa is, is not where it should be, but it's better, where it, mm, better than mm. where it was. Um, so there's, there's, some, there's certain areas where they will, in, especially in Cape Town, there's certain areas where they will they'll have recycling come around on certain days general rubbish is on like a okay. Wednesday for for me where i live but then on a thursday and a friday they may come and say right we're coming to collect all the mm -hmm. tins mm -hmm. and glass and then tomorrow we're going to come and do plastics whatever you know yeah i mean the thing is that for me it's about not actually producing the trash in the first place because you how you know what happens with you you are a responsible person and you you like separating your trash into like tins and glass and general waste right but then what how yes. do you know what happens with it and i have been during my travels actually looking on a satellite and going to the landfills to see what ends up in the landfills like in, yes. in in balkans or throughout the europe and you will find that you have everything mixed together in the landfill And and then Scary, it's like eh? the question is, okay, how do we fight this? Well, the only way is to actually produce less waste, to be honest. I mean, in Czech Republic, and I think that came from Western Europe, um, not that, yeah, wait, let's not get into that, but the there are the shops which don't, which sells you stuff, but they don't give you any packaging. You have to bring your own packaging. So if you want to buy, I don't know, a chocolate bar, they have a chocolate bar in a box without the packaging yes. and you bring your own stuff and you buy rice, you buy pasta, you buy chocolate, you buy everything with like, you bring your own container, you weigh the container, you weigh the stuff you want to buy, you pay for the weight and that's it. No packaging whatsoever. Yes. So that's how it's started to Lovely. be in, in there. Yeah. Some of them, not many. That's, that's the way it should be. Uh, it, it, it really should. And I think you've kind of given me an idea <laughs> for my sponsors, which I'm always looking for. Um, accountability and the green footprint is, uh, and, 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 and your carbon footprint, I think. And I think that's something you should try and calculate is your, is your carbon footprint is, uh, is to let people understand, okay, well, I have a similar bike or for me, I have a similar vehicle. What's my carbon footprint? I'm, I'm using yep. diesel, yes. But, um, you know, there's so many different ways and means. I think yep. it's fascinating. Um, so quickly, yep. two things. Um, will you go to Paradise Valley for me, which is uh, not so far I can, from where yeah. you are? I would love to. Have you I been there been in the Paradise Valley itself. I was in a, uh, in a parallel valley. Um, it's a wonderful place. It's an amazing place. A um, whole area is absolutely amazing. So I, I'm... I'm waiting for the Paradise Valley because at the moment it was prohibited and uh, I think there was a police checkpoint in Paradise Valley, actually. So <laughs> I went to the different one. It's only prohibited if they find <laughs> out that you're there. Okay, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> yeah, but definitely I can go. Yeah, what, what, what do you have in mind? Do you it, want a picture? I, I want you to go and take a photo. It looks completely beautiful, little oasis type of vibe. It's uh, um, rocks and oh, yeah, palm yeah. trees and clear water it just looks completely gnarly um and lastly so this is this i don't know i don't know how long this this will take to answer but what is your best and worst moments that you've had while being on, on the, the track? track like completely devastating worst moments that you've experienced whether you broke a tire at one o'clock in the morning or uh, you know what is the best and worst moment that you've experienced so, that you can think of? <clears throat> I've been quite lucky, so I don't. I didn't really have that many. I didn't have accidents or anything. So, but there is one story which is actually combining the best and the worst, and I think that's about that's wonderful about it. So, when I was in uh, Kazakhstan, I again took the different route um, through the middle of nowhere. Yes. Uh, there was like a plateau, and um, it was just the uh, the sheep herders and the in yurts and all that and i was riding through there and there was a guy kanat is his name 
uh, uh, the Kaza guy on a motorcycle and it was broken and it was not running. And we were kind of like hands and, and you know, like, like the language barrier. So we kind of agreed that what I'm going to yes. do is that I'm going to um, take my rope and I'm going to pull him, uh, his motorcycle behind my motorcycle to his yard. Which I didn't know was about 10 kilometers away. So we have been doing off-road. I was pulling this guy on the back behind me. And then we arrived yeah. to the river and he points to the hill and says, that's his yurt. And I'm like, okay, but it's across the river. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be a really bad idea. But um, obviously... Yeah. I kind of didn't think it through. So I was pulling this guy um, on his little Chinese bike through the river. And obviously, you know, if you're pulling someone on a motorbike, the balance is completely off, you know. And we yes. hit the stone and yes. I drowned the bike. I got the water in the, oh. in the engine. I had my, my engine oil um, turn into cappuccino, really. Um, so I was oh. in the middle of nowhere with the bike, with the, with the cappuccino in the engine. Um, it was raining. It was really kind of bad. And it was kind of a grim moment because I had only one liter of oil with me. I couldn't change it. And I didn't know if I can ride 100 kilometers to the next village to get oil. So that was kind of the worst yes. because I had to disassemble the bike and the water was everywhere, you know. And it was really anxiety because there was the first time i drowned the bike i didn't really know what to do with yes. it and on that thing the best thing happened and the best thing is that i had an opportunity to stay three days in a yurt in 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 a in a kazakhstan with this wonderful family um they helped me they basically jumped on a horse and went to the next year and they brought me uh, oil from Lada Niva. Unfortunately, they put it in a plastic bottle with water. So, uh, well, that was a little bit, oh. but, you know, and I had, I had spent three days of um, really living with, uh, with Kanat and his family. And that was probably the, the most wonderful moment of, of uh, the whole journey because um, you can finally kind of, see uh how the people live and you can be part of them i played yes. with the kids and i was listening to the stories they they killed the sheep and we kind of had I, I could see all that process how they processed the meat and all that and and eventually i just changed the oil and went and you know that's something you you just rarely have an opportunity to to experience so that was really cool that was really cool <laughs> that is amazing, dude. And you know, I, I I I say this on 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 every podcast is that no good story ever starts off with uh, when I went to the kitchen to boil the kettle for a cup of tea. <laughs> you know, it's a uh, it's a story exactly like you're saying of hardship and fun and and tormentation, thinking your 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 uh, your your only motor transport is swallowed. Um, but listen, Pavel, I really want to thank you for the time. I think you've been an, an amazing trooper and uh, very helpful. And I, I, I really implore you to keep doing what you're doing. And um, I think it's amazing of, uh, of, where, of, of what you're trying to achieve, especially with the plastic and the trees. And it's, it's giving back to communities on things that are not really commonly spoken Thank you about. very much for having me. It was really, really good. And I think we are a little bit over time, but uh, I mean, we could probably spend hours and hours. So... I totally Completely. wish uh, good luck with the project, with the with the glasses for the kids and all that, that the borders open and you can go. That would be absolutely amazing. And I really hope that I make it to the South Africa, actually, um, hopefully starting September again. Uh, so uh, hope. Well, we're not going anywhere, and the, and the, and you'll you'll completely uh, enjoy the ride all the way down here. And I'm sure as much as I would enjoy the ride up there, but uh, I've got a, I've got a, a little bit more Indeed. responsibility. Indeed. Well, perfect. So, Thank you very much for anyway. having me. It was an absolute pleasure. Have a have a blessed day, and we'll always stay in touch. Okay. Thanks bye -bye. a lot.